This video is sponsored by Adobe Photoshop. Hello, I'm Mimi. I'm a digital artist and content creator. So being able to take great photos of my art to post on social media is a really useful skill that has helped me reach a lovely community of artists over the past few years. When I started posting regularly on Instagram, I was photographing my pencil sketches to post every day. And even now that most of my art is digital, I still photograph my sketchbook pages for my Patreon illustration club every month. Plus I always end up needing photos of my art for something on social media. So let me show you some simple tips for taking great photos of your art and then how to easily edit them for different uses. So I want to take a photo of this artwork that I drew quite a while ago and I mostly want to use it for a square Instagram post but we'll probably want a vertical version for Instagram stories and maybe some other versions later on as well. Once you've picked out some art you'd like to photograph, find a surface near a window if you can where there's lots of natural light but not direct sunlight. For the background surface behind your art, I find it looks best to have something fairly neutral so if your tabletop isn't cute, you can try laying down a tablecloth or scrap of fabric which is what I often do. You can try out different fabrics to see what works well with your art, something that isn't busy so that it doesn't distract from your art too much, or you can try to find a natural surface like wood which can be really nice too. Now you could leave it at that if you like, but it's a bit plain so I really love laying a few objects around the art to frame it nicely and set the scene. This is called a flat lay if you want to look up some inspiration for it, and I usually lay out the art supplies that I use to make it, maybe some other art that I've made, or other objects like plants. Take a look around your art space or in your art drawer and find a few objects that you can place around your art to act as a sort of border or scene around it. It's okay that most of these objects will be cropped out in the final square Instagram post. We really just need the edges of them to show that there are some other things on the table and to tell a little bit of a story. You can tell any story you like with these objects. Think of them as support for your art. So you could have a colorful theme, maybe a reading theme, a nature theme, or even a picnic theme. Whatever you think suits your art and your social media profile. Once everything is laid out, you're ready to take a few photos. You can honestly just use your smartphone because most of them have really good cameras these days, especially if you've got lots of natural light. So try to be directly over the artwork and center it in the middle of frame, unless of course you specifically want to take it at a different angle. Make sure that your art is in focus and there aren't any big shadows or harsh lights over it and take the photo from a bit further away than the final framing so that we have some room to play with when we edit it because we can always crop in some more. So now that you have some photos of your art on your phone, you'll probably need to do just a little bit of editing to them to brighten things up and make your artwork stand out. So next, the photo editing. Select your favorite photo and bring it into your photo editing software. I use Adobe Photoshop and first we'll crop it to the size and framing we want for social media. For my Instagram post, I want it to be square and I want it framed so that my art is quite big in the frame, but we still see a bit of the setting that we made around the edges. Then I like to make some simple adjustments, starting with increasing the brightness and contrast a little bit. Nothing crazy, just enough so that it looks nice and vibrant on a phone screen. You can also increase the saturation a little bit because I find that the camera often desaturates things a little bit, although your phone might auto edit some photos for you. So just be careful if you are increasing the saturation that you don't give it too much. And lastly, I like to use the levels adjustment, which gives you these three tabs you can drag to change where the black point, midpoint and white point is. Nothing in this photo is stark white, so I can bring the white point down a bit in this photo to where the data in this graph starts without losing any highlights. And if you bring the black point up a bit, it'll strengthen the blacks. So with a really basic photo editing pass done, we can export this photo as a JPEG so that it's ready to post to Instagram. Now the great thing about the photo we took is that there's space for us to expand this to another format like a vertical Instagram story and we still have all of these things in the background so that it doesn't feel empty. But what I really want to show you is how you can adjust this photo if you want space for text on it. 
So Adobe Photoshop has this really cool new feature that lets you remove or add things in your scene. So if I make a selection around all of these elements at the top where I want space for some text, and then go to the Generative Fill tool, it allows me to either type in what I want in that space, or I can leave it blank and ask it to generate. It's going to generate a new background based on what it thinks the background of our scene is, which for us is this linen fabric, so I'm hoping it will understand that. So I'll let it think about that for a few moments. And here it's given us three options to choose from. It figured out that to remove those items, it should continue the linen pattern, which is great. I used to manually do things like this with the stamp tool, but Generative Fill has saved me a whole lot of time by replicating the linen fabric for me. So I haven't really asked it to fabricate anything completely new. It's just given me a nice blank space for text that matches my existing background, which is really handy because now I can use this for my Instagram stories, but put text there without any big text boxes. And it's non-destructive, so it's just a new layer above everything else that we can hide if we want to go back to the original. So really easily, I've been able to make two vertical photos, one with our original background and one with space for text that I can post to Instagram stories, Pinterest, or any other vertical social media post based on our original photo. Now that we have this plain space at the top of the image, we can add something new there if we want to. So with a new selection of the space, I can bring up generative fill again, and this time I'll ask it to add something. So I'll generate some torn paper because that's always a really useful banner that feels like it's organically in the scene. This is a design element I often use to place text onto, but usually I manually place in a torn paper asset. So I wanna see if Photoshop can put something similar in my scene for me. So this time it tried to mimic some of the other paper in the scene, which has some painting on it, but I don't want that. I just want a plain piece of paper with a torn edge. This third one is quite good, but I think the angle is too strong for what I need. So I can just adapt the prompt with some more information and generate again. This first option is much more what I was after and it's given it a shadow and everything so that it looks like it's part of my scene. Now I could have gone and photographed this flat lay again with a piece of paper in it, but I've already packed everything away and I didn't think in advance that I would necessarily want a version of the scene like this. And this is a much faster and more flexible way to add supportive design elements that don't interfere with the art itself. So I'll just put my logo on this paper and this will now be a nice Pinterest pin that can link to my Instagram or my website. Now I'd also love to show you how to reformat this photo for a horizontal thumbnail, which is something that I need to do often for my YouTube videos, but for you, you might need to do that for something like a blog post. I optimize this frame for vertical use, and so when I go to crop to a horizontal ratio, I have a little bit of photo room to play with, but I'm a bit limited at the sides. And my thumbnails need space for text, so I'll usually frame the main element on one side. I can use Generative Expand though, which is similar to the Generative Fill tool we were just using to fill that empty space off the edge of my artboard, and I'll just leave the prompt blank to let it generate an extension of my existing scene. A tool like this is really handy for creators because I can't tell you the amount of times that I've had a great photo that I really like, but I just need it to be in a different image ratio and have to try and come up with something to put in the blank spaces. The three options that it's given me are actually really interesting because it's finished off the pencils where they were previously cut off at the edge of the frame, which is really clever. It doesn't seem to know what to do with this bowl that was in the corner though, and fair enough, there wasn't a lot for it to go off, but I can always select these strange bits that it's given me and add another fill layer to remove them. So I'm pretty happy with the generative expand on this photo. I'm going to put text over on the left hand side anyway, so it doesn't have to be perfect. It just needs to support the rest of the image and blend in. Let's say I wanted to make a blog post or YouTube tutorial for this art. I could just add my title and you don't even realize that the background has been amended. So from one photo of my art, I've been able to create an Instagram post, two Instagram stories variations, a specific Pinterest pin, and a horizontal thumbnail. 
Now, if you know in advance exactly what uses you'll have for this photo, you can of course rearrange the flat lay when you're photographing it to be optimized for vertical, horizontal, then with space for text, etc. But realistically, I'm never that organized, so Photoshop's new tools give a lot more flexibility from just one photo. I know that AI is a bit of a sensitive subject for artists, but I think that practical applications like this where I haven't fundamentally changed the scene, the artwork hasn't been touched, I've just optimized the background for different design needs, is a really useful thing for creators and small business owners to be able to do quickly and easily. I was already editing my photos before if I needed space for text or wanted to add a paper tear or some foreground. It's just that now Photoshop's generative AI tools can do the same thing faster and you don't need loads of training in Photoshop to know how to do it. So give Photoshop a go for yourself today or learn more about their new generative AI features by using the link in my description. They've said that their generative AI tools are trained to be commercially safe using licensed images from Adobe Stock and out of copyright public domain content. So I'd love to know what you think about generative AI tools like this. Let us know in the comments whether applications like the ones I shared today are something that you'd like to use in your workflow. And if you'd like to see more tutorials, then you can get instant access to my library of art lessons and my monthly illustration club by joining me on Patreon, where I post a couple of times a week. You're very welcome to browse the articles and tutorials that are available already on my website first before you join if you want to see what you'll have access to. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, give it a like or subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye!